My name is Patrick McGinnis, and I'm the guy who invented the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out. Today, FOMO is an epidemic, and it's changing us so much that it sort of feels like we're evolving into a new species. But FOMO doesn't have to take over your life. You can find the power to choose what you actually want and the courage to miss out on the rest. I'll show you how right here on FOMO Sapiens. FOMO. FOMO. Welcome to FOMO Sapiens, the show about finding the power to choose what you actually want in business and life and the courage to miss out on everything else. I'm your host, Patrick McGinnis, also known as the creator of FOMO, and I am coming at you from AW360 Studios in the global capital of FOMO, New York City. So unless you've been living under a rock, you've probably heard something about FOMO, but I'd be willing to bet that you probably don't know too much about FOBO, which stands for fear of a better option. FOBO is an aversion to making decisions. It's about living in a world of maybes rather than closing down paths and choosing just one thing. Here's the thing about FOMO and FOBO. There are legions of people out there who spend their days developing tools that use these forces in order to get you to take action, such as buying a product or downloading an app. Whether it's the notifications that come up on your iPhone or the design features in dating apps that get you to swipe left or swipe right, All of these things happen by design. They're built by really smart people and they're based on psychology and knowledge of human motivation. So it's important to know how to spot these tools and to understand how they affect your behavior. Today, I have the ideal guest to help us break down what's really going on behind the scenes and to tell us how to use these tools for good as well as show us how to overcome distraction that afflicts many of us in the digital age. Nir Eyal writes, consults, and teaches about the intersection of psychology, technology, and business. In fact, MIT Technology Review dubbed Nir the prophet of habit-forming technology. Nir has founded two companies since 2003 and has taught at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. He is also the author of the best-selling book, Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products. In addition to blogging at nearandfar.com, Nir's writing has been featured in the Harvard Business Review, TechCrunch, and Psychology Today. Welcome, Nir. I'm Hi. humbled that you uh, said all that. Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate it. Welcome to FOMO Sapiens. So, Thanks. So you, um, I can't wait to talk to you about all of these things today, but I want to start with a question that is of utmost importance, which is, what is giving you FOMO right now? Yeah, so what's giving me FOMO is that I feel like I'm missing out on the discussion around technology's place in our lives, that I've been kind of in a cave lately finishing my next book, which is called Indistractable, which will be out soon. And Indistractable is really all about the central question of how do we make sure we do the things that we say we're going to do? That's what an indistractable person is. Uh, and I've kind of taken a back seat lately, and unfortunately, I don't participate in the conversation that is happening uh, Uh, that tends to vilify technology and it drives me nuts and I have this fear that I'm missing out on that discussion because I think so much of it unfortunately is wrong-headed. I think uh, we've we've now the the pendulum has swung the other way and we have now become a society that that finds it convenient to blame products for our behavior and so what I want to do with this next book Indistractable is the fact that I was in the field that you know I wrote Hooked having built habit forming technology I, I want to kind of peel back the curtain a little bit and show people one how it's done and that two they're actually in much more control than they might think they are that is good news because let me tell you something I am incredibly addicted. I am currently distracted. I bet most of the people listening to this or watching this are all, are also in that same boat. Um, so I uh, today we're going to get you to tell Good. us some of your just some. Of, we're going to buy the book. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe yeah. a little bit of an update. I want to show you this. The, I want to reveal why you're not actually addicted probably (laughs) chances are uh you are not addicted by the end of this episode we'll talk about that good this is amazing okay you're gonna change my life um (laughs) but before we go there i do want to talk about hooked because when i so the first time i ever heard about you was um when somebody told me you got to meet this guy near and and then i started reading up about you and this is before i had thought about writing a book it was like early in my time um in this whole world of writing and all the stuff that we do and um i i heard about this and i realized you have legions of fans out there and then i went and saw you give a workshop and i realized you have people who come to your workshops to learn how to build habit forming products but you also mentioned at this workshop which really stuck with me um you, you did not call the book how to form how to build addiction right forming products so right. like you're not trying to get people to come up with a better type of tobacco um, so what is the difference between building a habit-forming product and 
building something that makes people addicted and actually actually really bad for them. Right. No, so this is a, a perfect question. And I can always tell who read the book based on whether they ask me, oh, you're the guy who, who told people to how to build addictive products. And there's actually a whole chapter about the morality of manipulation and why it's not ethical to build for addiction. And it starts from the basic definition of what an addiction is. An addiction is a persistent compulsive dependency on a behavior or substance that harms the user. Okay, that word harm is critical here. It's something that harms you and that you want to stop but can't stop or requires a lot of effort to stop. That is a very different definition, even though we toss it around all the time, right? People say, I'm addicted to chocolate or I'm addicted to Facebook. My wife got a, a package from the DSW uh, uh, shoe store that said highly addictive contents inside, right? So we toss this word around, addiction everywhere. <laughs> but it, it, right, but it does have a medical term that, that we've kind of uh, apply to everything. And I think we do that. Uh, because it's very convenient for us to do that, right? That we like the fact that if, if I say that a product is responsible for my behavior, it kind of relieves me of some responsibility. Uh, it also, I think, helps us it, by understanding the difference between an addiction and a habit. It gets back to this question of why did I write a book about how to build habits versus building addiction? Because a habit is defined as a behavior done with little or no conscious thought. And habits, unlike addictions, which are always bad, habits, we can have good habits as well as bad habits. So when I wrote Hooked, I did not write Hooked for Facebook and for Google and for Snapchat and for uh, Slack, these companies that understand consumer psychology, right? They understand what makes you click and what makes you tick better than you understand yourself. I didn't need to write it for them. I use them as case studies so that the rest of us, all kinds of businesses out there that can help people do things they want to do, but for lack of good product design, the customer doesn't do, right? Why should it just be Facebook and the gaming companies and YouTube that use all these psychology tactics? All of us should build better products with better user experience using the exact same tactics to help people do things they want to do. That's really why I wrote Hooked, and that's why it's all about habits not about addiction. So what's a company that does as well, like for good, right? Yeah. That uses these strategies that you outline successfully. Right, there's lots of companies out there. I mean, there's literally thousands of companies. Most companies out there, they're not struggling with getting people addicted, right? Oh, when I give a workshop, I have never in my years of teaching encountered anybody who said, you know what, we have a real problem with people who are addicted to our product. <laughs> that just doesn't happen for most right, companies. Right. Most companies, the problem is, nobody gives a shit about my product, right? Why won't people use what I built for them? It's so fantastic. Fantastic if they would only use it. So that's really, by and large, the real problem here. You know, the, the real problem is not that a few companies like Facebook and Twitter and WhatsApp and Snap, ha Snapchat have figured out how to uh, suck us in. The real problem is that far too many products out there just suck, right? They're awful. If you think about interacting with government services, your local businesses, uh, you know, things that can help you live a healthier life, most of the software is awful. And so that's really the goal of why I wrote Hooked is to make these products usable, to help people do things they want to do. But again, for lack of product, good product design, they don't do. Uh, so that's really been the focus of my work so far when it came to, to Hooked. You know, as you're talking about this, I'm thinking about in my own life, I don't know if you're a sweet green consumer, but sweet green is healthy. It's delicious. It's, you know, farm raised. It, if you ate sweet green every day, in my opinion, you would be in much better health. And mm. they have actually created an app where you get points when you eat there and they've mm. gamified eating. And I hate to admit it, but I will go there purely for the <laughs> points experience. You know, I'm like thinking, cause you get a prize at a thousand dollars spent. Yeah. And they, you know, that is a, gr a great example for my own life. As I think about what you're talking about, yeah. I can see that they've created a habit. It's not addictive. It's not like I can't right. it's live without you. my guacamole greens. Right. But at the same time, there is like a, a level of, I guess, Slight, slight compulsion to want to take part in their experience, which is right. also an awesome experience. So they, they've used this tried and true tactic of a loyalty program. I don't yes. talk about loyalty I'm programs. I'm an easy mark, yeah. apparently, because like, well, this has been around for 100 years. It's been around for a very me, long it's time. it's like brand new. When I, I try to go, I don't talk about that as a, as a particular tactic, because I think people kind of know about this loyalty idea, but it is, a, it is a, you know, effective, right? It does use a few psychological biases uh, uh, called the endowment effect, right? That when you get those uh, badges, when, you, when you're on your way to getting a free reward, it makes you more likely to, to keep coming back. Uh, I dive a level deeper, and I think uh, some of the, you asked earlier about the technologies that I particularly uh, find yeah. habit-forming in a good way, these are companies that I put my money where my mouth is. I mean, I'm an angel investor, and I, whenever I see a company that uses these tactics for good, that helps people build healthy habits, uh, I'm, I'm all in. I, I invest in these companies. So a company like Seven Cups, 
which uh, provides free online therapy. Right, creates this habit around wow. finding therapy online. Uh, another company that I love called Bite Foods. Uh, they are building these healthier vending machines. Right, people, uh, a lot of people who don't have access to fresh food, they get their lunch uh, through a vending machine. Right, if you're a busy nurse and you don't have time to go leave the hospital to go find your food, many times you just end up eating chips or sweets or other crap in a vending machine. So they built these vending machines that changes people's eating habits using this, this, uh, these types of behavioral design principles to change people's eating habits. Wow. Uh, there's many other companies. Marco Polo I invested in, which is a, an app that helps people stay in touch with each other, which is a wonderful product. Uh, so the list goes on and on. I invest in these companies whenever I can. Uh, one company I didn't get to invest in, but I, I really love that's really changed my habits is an app called Fitbod, uh, which is basically solving this problem problem of when I used to go to the gym, I wanted to get in shape, but I didn't know what to do. So Fitbod uses this, uh, this algorithm to tell you, you know, what to, how much weight to lift, what exercise to do, how many reps to do. So it's really taken this principle of a habit being a behavior done with little or no conscious thought. When I open up Fitbod, there's no thinking. I just do what it tells me to do. And that is an example of a very healthy habit. Yeah. So we can use hooks, which is what I talk about in the essence of my book. We can use these design principles that do use psychological manipulation. Absolutely. They use these brain hacks, but for good, right? To help people live happier, healthier, more productive lives. I love that. And I love the fact, by the way, that you're a 10% entrepreneur. So you're investing in these companies on the side, using the expertise you built in all the work you're doing to actually build a portfolio, which sounds like it could get pretty valuable in the future. Well, I read this amazing book called The 10% Entrepreneur. I remember when I read your book, I actually, I, I can envision exactly where I was. I was on a flight and I printed it. I printed out this was when it was a manuscript. It wasn't published yet. Right. And I read the whole thing in one flight. It was such a good book. Wow. It was such a great read. And uh, oh, okay. I that's absolutely subscribe. <laughs> All of Nier's fans, you, you know, <laughs> putting it out there. It's a great book. So let me ask you a question about, yeah. about habit. Um, people always say if you do something for 21 days, I'm sure you've heard this, mm -hmm. that you've formed a habit. And I have tried to do this in my own life. You know, it's like, I get to 21 yeah. days. I'll have succeeded. Is that true? No, it's not. <laughs> okay. There is the. There, it's been around this urban legend of there's some kind of magic number that the 21 days, I mean, 45 days, it 60 convincing days. Convincing to me, right? As as all urban legends do, right? That there's crocodiles in the New York uh, uh, subway system or whatever as well. You know, it's not true, but it's it sounds like it might be true. Right. So it's another one of these urban legends. What we do know that has uh, quite a bit of uh, of evidence behind it is that uh, two things. One, the more frequently a behavior occurs, so the higher frequency a behavior occurs, the more likely it is to become a habit, and that there is a precipitous drop-off in the likelihood of forming a habit if the behavior does not occur within a week's time or less. So those are the things we, we do know when it comes to designing a habit-forming product. It really has to meet that frequency test. It has to be something that's used frequently enough, at least within a week's time or less. And of course, the more often people interact with it, the more likely it is to change their habits. So of course, when we think about our phones, right? when we think about our devices, and the stats are telling us that the average smartphone user is checking their home screen on their phone 100 150 times a day, that has a high propensity to change their habits in their day-to-day -day lives. So unfortunately, there isn't a magic number. There's a lot more to that. There's an average, but it also has to do with a lot of other factors. For example, the emotional valence of that behavior, You know how important it is to you. It's not that you can just keep doing it again and again. There's also a lot of confusion out there between a habit and a routine. So for example, you know, people say, I want to get into the habit of running every day or the habit of reading every day or whatever it is that they want to magically put on autopilot. You know, when they say, I want to get into the habit of something, it generally means I want to do something but without the effort. Yeah. It's not quite that easy because by definition, if the behavior is effortful, it ain't a habit. Because what's the definition of a habit? A behavior done with little or no conscious thought. So if reading a book requires conscious thought, it's not a habit, it's a routine. Right? What is a habit, exercising might not be a habit, right? because if it requires effort, if it's like, oh, now I gotta do this, that's not a habit. But when I'm at the gym, the app telling me what to do, and now I don't have to think about it anymore, that might be a habit. That is fast. Okay, so the, that, you know, that's gonna change my life because I, you know, I, I'm one of these people who, I want to do all of these sorts of things, but I think maybe if I were able to increase the tools around me, which make it easier to do it and become right. sort of effortless, I'd be more successful. And, and it can become, for some people it is effortless. Like some people who are in a routine of running, yes. right? When they run, 
Yeah, they do zone out. Like I, I got to this stage after many, many yes, years. It took me a long training, time. Right? I mean, if you've ever trained for a marathon, you right. get to that point. Where you zone out and you kind of lose this sense of time. You get into this this float that Cheek Sent Me High calls flow, uh, where, where you, you, you kind of, you know, zone out. You're, you're in this uh, habit state. And that can be a habit where it actually feels bad if you don't do that behavior. Yes. That's when you really know you're habituated. Yes. But for people just starting out, there is that routine phase where it's going to feel very effortful. It's not going to feel like it's a habit for quite a while. Well, this kind of reminds me of when you go to the yoga class and you are, you're kind of in your place. And you know, I, I'm a kind of a yogi, so I, I go pretty frequently and I find it really helps me. But there's always that person next to you or a couple people down who has their phone in the room. And then about, you know, three minutes into the Shavasana <laughs> meditation part of the end of the class, which they always tell you is the most important part, which I don't know if it really is, but I'm willing to go with that. Their yeah. phone starts ringing oh, and it's distracting. <laughs> and you have been doing a lot of thinking about distracting, uh, distracting items in our lives and distraction. You're working on a new book about it. And I was reading some of the things that you've been writing because you are a prolific publisher of ideas and thoughts. <laughs> And you talk about, in one of the talks you gave, the fact that if you had to choose a superpower right now in this day and age and in our modern times, you would choose the ability to, I guess, be indistractable. Right. So I get, I mean, I would choose invisibility or flight, <laughs> but I, I want to hear what, what is it about this, this skill that is so important in, yeah. in our lives? Right. So the, I define being indistractable as being the kind of person who does what they say they're going to do. Okay. And imagine how your life would change if everything that you promised to yourself, you uphold it. I mean, we, we're taught in school not to lie to people. Right, that that's that's something you you wouldn't want to do. You wouldn't want to be the kind of person who uh, makes an appointment with a friend to go get lunch and then doesn't show up, or promise your mom that you're gonna spend some time with her and then flake out. Like that, that's clearly somebody who's who's not a very good person. And yet we lie to ourselves all the time. We say we're gonna exercise. We say we're not gonna eat this type of food. We say we're not gonna check our devices. We say we're gonna read a book as opposed to watching Netflix, and we don't. And what this basically means is that we're getting distracted. So I, I define distraction as these actions that we take that move us away from what we really want to do. And the opposite of distraction is traction. Things that we do, actions that we take that move us closer to what we want to do. So the big idea behind my next book, Indistractable, is how do we do more of these acts of traction, these things that move us towards what we want, and make sure that we don't get as distracted as we are today. How can we, how can we do that? What kind of steps can we take? And it turns out it's actually not that hard, but it's pretty profound in terms of uh, the impact it can have on your life. That is amazing, first of all. And I think, you know, obviously... FOMO sapiens, if you have FOMO, you are distracted. If you have FOBO, you are not only distracted, but you're also, by not deciding anything, you're just basically being a narcissist. And I think mm. a lot of these behaviors are bad in and of themselves. When you add in the impact you have on other people, like right. you mentioned, when you're you know saying you're going to do something, it's one thing if you're saying you're going to do something, you're going to um, read a book and you don't do it because you hurt yourself. Mm -hmm. It's another thing if you say, I'm going to do something, commit to others, and then don't do it because then you end up hurting all kinds of other people. Mm -hmm. um, you, in your talks, you know, obviously these are not new things. These, there have been flaky people since probably the time of the Romans or before. And so that's why, one, why I started exploring habit forming technology. I wanted to understand how it works so that it could be used for good. But then I also wanted to understand how could I get it under control in my own life. And so uh, my first instinct was to blame the technology, right? So here's what I did. I, I did digital minimalism. I, uh, I got rid of as many- Was of, this like 2015 or something? No, like? this was a long time ago. This was like 2010. Wow, you were way ahead of the curve. Well, it, you know, my writing has always been, even back when I first started writing about this stuff, it's always been 50% about how to build habit forming technology and 50% about how to manage okay. these unwanted habits. Uh, because of, you know, they, they say research is me-search. So I, I wanted to figure out how to deal with this stuff myself. So my first reaction was, okay, it's the technology's fault, right? Technology addiction is caused by technology. Turns out that's not true at all, because here's what happened. I got myself a feature phone, right? So, you know, like those yes. phones that have no apps and no nothing. That was actually fairly recent. That was about two years ago. And then I also got myself, I found on eBay, this word processor uh, that's not connected to the internet back wow. in the 1990s, right? <laughs> and you can only type on. And I was like, okay, now I have done away with my internet connection. Now I'll focus. Now I will be indistractable. 
And of course, that didn't work at all because the problem is not just the technology. The fact is, distraction starts from within. So here's what happened. I had my feature phone. I had my stupid word processor that only allowed me to type. And then I saw, hmm, there's that interesting book on my shelf. And you know what? The laundry needs to be folded. I hate folding laundry. I love the analog distractions. Like, oh, I think yeah. I'll cut some firewood. Exactly. I was folding laundry because I was, like, you know, trying to That's desperately incredible. look for something else to do to avoid this discomfort of having to do my work. And so what I started to realize is that I had to figure out what was going on inside me. That distraction is not just about the things that distract us. The icky, sticky truth that we don't like to confront is that it starts from right here. Right? We have to start with this question of why are we getting distracted? Why can't I sit with my family without looking at Facebook? Why do I have to have the television on uh, all the time in my house? Why can't I go out with friends and not have the basketball game on so that we can have just a civil adult conversation? What is it that I'm escaping that I require my cell phone or uh, a, a, a website or booze or a drug to escape? Because it all comes from the same basic tendency. And the fact is, it's not just about the substance or the distraction. It starts with what's going on in here. That is, that's a, first of all, that's a lot of information that, and I, and I just want to unpack it because I think it, it is interesting if you think about it. I have these images of Socrates trying to sit down and write and then going out and walking, I guess, <laughs> going into the Parthenon or something. Am I right about that? Would, he, would that work from a historical perspective? I think so. <laughs> um, and, and, and we oftentimes, as you said, we think of this as an external thing. I've done the same thing, by the way. I got rid of Twitter mm -hmm. because, because Twitter was eating up my days and I replaced it with other websites. Mm -hmm. So it's not, right. I don't go to Twitter anymore. Now I'm going to Political Wire or something else to get my political news and get all get that reaction, get that anger, get that frustration. Right. Right. Whereas I didn't take the time to have an introspective perspective on it and figure out how it could actually change things. So. Assuming I want to do that now because you've, you know, you've opened my eyes and I do actually want less distraction, what, uh, what should I do? Yeah. So the first thing is to think about it in its component parts. So we talked about traction are things that move you forward. Distractions are things that move you back. Both end in the same word, action, reminding us that, that these behaviors, traction and distraction, are not things that happen to us. It is things that we do. And then we have to think about what prompts our action. Well, what prompts our action are internal triggers and external triggers. External triggers you'll be familiar with. These are the pings, the dings, the rings that yes. prompt you to either traction. For example, your alarm clock rings in the morning. That prompts you to wake up. And that's a helpful thing. That's what I intended to do. That's an act of traction. Uh, if it's a Facebook notification or a call when I really wanted to do some, some uh, focused work, that would lead me to an act of distraction. Right? So we've got the external triggers that move our actions towards distraction or traction. And then we have these internal triggers, which I hinted at earlier. These are these uncomfortable emotional states, these, uh, these, these triggers that start from within. And it turns out that all human behavior is prompted not by what we used to think, what Freud called the pleasure principle, which is that all humans are, uh, all our behavior is prompted towards the seeking of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. Turns out that neurologically speaking, that's not actually true. Mm. Turns out that it's pain all the way down. That everything that we do is not about the pursuit of pleasure, but in fact, it's all about the avoidance of pain. Everything we do. It's not about uh, the pursuit of pleasure. It's about the avoidance of pain. So even wanting, desire, craving itself feels uncomfortable. Uh, so what we have to do is to understand these internal triggers so that we can manage them, so that we can cope with them. Uh, it, it all takes place because of this homeostatic response. So for example, uh, if I walk into a room and it's cold, I want to put on my coat. If it's hot, I want to take my coat off. If I feel hunger pangs, I eat, and then when I'm stuffed, I stop eating. And so those same physiological responses, the same exact um, principle carries over to our psychological states. When I'm feeling bored, I check YouTube or the news. If I'm lonely, I check Facebook. If I'm uncertain, I Google. So we have to ask ourselves what's going on inside. What's that psychological state that I don't know how to cope with without looking towards a distraction? And then when we start focusing on those internal triggers, we can deal with them. And we deal with them in two ways. One, we can look at the source of the discomfort. We can fix the problem. Or we learn tactics to cope in a healthier manner with that discomfort. And so that's the first step. That's the very first step of this four-step process is managing those internal triggers by fixing what's actually causing the internal triggers or finding new tactics to cope. And so that's what the book is really about. How do we do that? How do we fix these problems? Uh, a big source of these internal triggers is the work environment. 
right? That many people, when they say, oh my God, I can't get anything done. There's so, you know, I'm constantly bombarded with, with email and with Slack notifications. Uh, I, I, you know, there, I, I can't concentrate because there's all these work-related uh, uh, notifications that bombard me throughout my day. And that's why I can't be with my kids. What's interesting though, is when I ask them, you know, what would happen if tomorrow, let's do a little thought experiment. Tomorrow, you win $40 million in the lottery, right? You never have to work for money another day in your life. Do you check your work email account the next day? Do you look at your Slack notifications when you'd rather be with your kids? Of course Definitely. you don't. Do you? Yeah, I think you, well, I would do it just out of curiosity. Okay. Think, to be like, this is what I'm missing out on. I got the JOMO right now. All right, so you're going to the next step. I actually I guess asked really, this I'm really sad. I guess you, I need more, more, I need to read your book three times. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's funny. Somebody else had that reaction too, and they said something like, uh, yeah, I would check it one more time just so I could tell everybody at work, suckers, I'm out of here. <laughs> like that, you know, other than that though, you, you know, if, you, if you're, it's not the technology that we're addicted you're, to, no, it's right. work that we're addicted to, right? It's the fact that we have this anxiety around, am I doing what my boss asked me to do? Am I on top of everything? Are people waiting on me? Is my client requesting something? Those create the stress and anxiety which fuels the internal triggers to keep us checking. So it's not actually the technology on its own. It's work fueled, fueling these internal triggers which the reaction that we have is to try and satiate those internal triggers with the use of our devices. So a big part of the book has to do with how do we change our cultures uh, in our work environments from this culture of responsiveness, this culture that dictates that we have to constantly be online. So that's the source of the internal triggers. And then I talk about a lot of tactics for how we can cope with those internal triggers. Because let's face it, you can't always snap your fingers and change your company culture. Right. Right? You, a lot of people don't have the luxury to just say, well, I don't like the company culture here, I'm leaving. Uh, we have to learn tactics to also cope uh, as well with the internal triggers that have nothing to do with work, right? The, the boredom, the anxiety, the uncertainty of everyday life. We need new tactics that don't involve satiating escapist in an escapist manner with our devices. And it's so critical because you see people getting burned out. I th it's, everything you said really resonates with me as somebody who has worked in intense jobs and then left those jobs. Mm. And when you quit a job, it's almost like being a lame duck hmm. person in office. Like you go from caring a heck of a lot one day to the next day, basically being like, well, I'm out of here in three months so or two months or whatever the number is. When you decide you... De, you sort of de-invest yourself of yeah. caring and then nothing can really rise. All the things that seem so important, it's like, oh, the TPS report that we had to file, all of a sudden those things seem so mundane. Right. Um, but at the same time, you know, if we can't quit our job, if we're stuck there and we keep running on that treadmill, we are, we're just going to burn out. And I think you can see that with, I, I agree with you. If, you, if I think about the number of modes of communication I use on a daily basis, LinkedIn, Facebook, um, Twitter, Slack, uh, WhatsApp, email, messages. Right. Uh, that's seven alone that I need to check on a daily basis. That kind of uh, interaction, that kind of distraction, it basically uh, it really puts you in a place where I dread looking at my phone in the morning. And mm -hmm. I used to get up all giddy to check my email, and now I basically really hate email. So, yeah. so these are really important tricks. I want to ask you, how do you... Um, how do you you have you have children? I have one. You, yeah. yeah. How do you you have so you you told a story about your daughter? She, her super I think her superpower is probably you know also something like I wish my superpower was to get my dad not to be distracted. <laughs> um, but now she's she's got what she wanted. Yeah. Um, what, what how do you manage her, uh, all technology in her her life? Okay, so kids are a special category. There's actually a, a chapter in the next book that's going to be about kids, uh, and so. You know, kids, first and foremost, are a protected class of people, right? There's a lot of things that I wouldn't let my kid do. I wouldn't let her walk into a bar and order a gin and tonic. I wouldn't let her walk into a casino and, you know, gamble. Uh, and there's a lot of things on the internet I wouldn't let her do without supervision. Right? There's a lot of bad stuff she's not ready to see at 10 years old. Uh, but there's a lot of good stuff that she can do online as well. And so I think it's a matter of, uh, you know, having a conversation with our kids. I think, uh, you know, people tend to fall into two camps. One is this camp that says, well, technology should be, uh, you know, something that kids can just go off and use. And I think that's misguided. I don't know why we got this idea that uh, the iPad can be an iNanny. I think that's misguided. There's no form of media. Uh, there's books I would not let her read. There's definitely stuff on TV I would not let her watch. 
without guidance, without supervision. And of course, anything she can find on the web, she needs some supervision around that. So that's one big thing. The other camp of people are the people who, uh, who are very restrictive and they take it all away and they think, okay, I'm not gonna let my kid play video games and I'm not gonna let them use the devices. Uh, and I think that's also a mistake. What we need is simply a conversation with our kids uh, and to understand uh, at a deeper level, first and foremost, why they are seeking escape, right? We talked about earlier how as adults, we use these devices many times as pacifiers, as a way to escape an uncomfortable reality. And guess what? Our kids do the same thing. The, the part of the reason that kids use their devices so much these days is because they're not getting their psychological needs met in other areas of their life. You know, it used to be that neighborhoods across the country were singing with the sound of kids playing. That doesn't happen anymore because this generation of kids has been taught stranger danger and that after school they need to go to swimming class and Kumon and Mandarin and they're so hyper scheduled that they don't have the time to get their psychological needs met of just free play, which is all but extinguished in our society today. So when our kids are either programmed into, a, a pro, into some kind of after school activity or made to go behind lock and key after school so that they can be safe at home, what do we expect them to do? Of course they're gonna to turn to a screen. They're turning to a screen to get their psychological needs met. That's where they can get a sense of mastery, a sense of competency, uh, a sense of relatedness. These are all fundamental human traits according to self-determination theory. And guess what? Games online and uh, social media satiate those needs. Not that they're a good substitute, but it's no surprise that they would turn to these technologies to satiate those psychological needs. So I think it starts first and foremost from understanding why they do this. And then it's about having a conversation with our kids to figure out how we can find uh, a use of technology that doesn't harm us, right? By focusing on the harm, not by saying, all video games are bad. Why? Because it seems like you enjoy them a lot, so you should stop. That's not a very good reason, right? What is the harm done? So we can base that harm on time, for example. So with my daughter, we had a conversation. We said, look, you know, these games and apps are designed to get you hooked, right? I wrote the book on it. I know how they do it. <laughs> now, many of these apps are great. They, my, my daughter uh, takes classes online. She uh, watches videos that teach her all kinds of interesting things. They're, they're not all bad, but all of them come at an expense of time that she could be doing something else, playing with her friends, being with us, reading a book, doing other things in her life. And so we asked her, what do you think would be a good amount of recreational screen time? And she said, I thought she'd say like five hours. She said 45 minutes. Well, great, 45 minutes, that's terrific. <laughs> and that's what she does. She enforces on her own at 10 years old, and she did this years ago, she enforces this 45 minutes per day of recreational screen time. It's a habit. Which it's I think is that's fine. That's amazing. Right, and she, the funny thing is she'll use technology to help her enforce her limits on technology use. So she'll tell the Amazon Alexa, hey, put a timer for 45 minutes. Uh, and it's, it's, it's amazing, like she actually does follow these rules that she sets for herself. And that's the big picture. The big picture here is not to train our kids to obey our orders, but to teach them these, these tactics to become indistractable themselves so that they can learn how to have the self-control because this isn't going away, right? If you think no. Facebook and video games are, are, are engaging, just wait till we get virtual reality and augmented reality. That's gonna be even more engaging. So this isn't gonna stop, right? We can't put, uh, we can't close Pandora's box. These technologies are out there and they're only gonna get more engaging. What we have to do is to learn how to become indistractable ourselves and to teach our kids the methods to, to manage these distractions as well. It really reminds me, I mean, this is kind of a, uh, you mentioned this a little earlier, but it reminds me of when I went to college. As a kid growing up, uh, actually my parents let me eat whatever I want, which is why I weighed almost 200 pounds in 10th grade, but then I lost all this weight and I learned how to eat healthy. Uh, I remember friends of mine whose parents would restrict everything they ate. They right. would write down everything and it was this whole culture around, you know, you, uh, your parents basically, if they came to your house, like they, the parents would call ahead and say like, don't give them anything. Hmm. And when these kids went off to college, oh, boy. It, was, it was like a free for all. I mean, like they'd never seen a slice of pizza before and they didn't know how to self-regulate. And, right. and so like anything else, um, setting a culture of, I guess, self-determination and responsibility in every aspect of your life, and especially in the digital world, um, seems seems like a really smart idea. And right. I think the book sounds like a great idea as well. Um, so if people, I mean, you've given us so much to think about today, but if people want to continue reading, um, you know, you have, a, you have a mailing list, you have lots of great content. Where can people find your... Sure. So I'm, I, uh, I'm giving out a lot of this content and techniques and tips in my book uh, away for free on my blog. I just want the techniques to be known out there. Uh, and the book will launch early 
early next year, so early 2019. And uh, my website is near and far, and near is spelled like my first name, N-I-R and far, so nearandfar.com. And my first book, in case you're a person who's building habit-forming technology and you want to build a kind of product that keeps people coming back on their own without spending a lot of money on expensive advertising or spammy messages, then you can check out my book, Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products. Amazing. Uh, and I recommend checking out Nier's, uh signing up for his, his, his writings that come, I guess, uh, every week or two. I have, I have formed a habit of reading them, but I am not <laughs> addicted. And, um, and uh, if you want to learn more about FOMO Sapiens, more about my work, about being a 10% entrepreneur, which Nier has done so well to use his talents to invest in companies outside of his day job, you can find more about me at patrickmcginnis.com. I can't promise you won't become addicted, but at the very least, you'll learn something new. Um, also, check me out on all the social media. All links through there. Um, and until next time, I'm coming at you from here in the Times Square offices of AW360, where there's lots happening around us, but we are fully focused. We're not distracted. And I'm trying to find a way to focus. So I look forward to seeing you next time on FOMO Sapiens.